Hello, everyone, and welcome. To begin our program today, I'm going to introduce Liliana Sierra, who's going to explain Spanish language interpretation. Liliana? Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, Margaret just shared. Buenas tardes, bienvenidas. Margaret acaba de compartir uh, para presentar Para comenzar el programa de hoy, voy a presentar a una de las intérpretes de inglés al español, Liliana Sierra, eh, va a explicar cómo funciona el, la interpretación. So, welcome everyone. Um, we will be offering Spanish-English interpretation as well as American Sign Language. And for Spanish and English interpretation, it will be important that everyone listening please select the language of your preference at the bottom of your screen. So at the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see an option that says language interpretation. You may click that and select English if that is the language of your preference. And um, if you prefer to listen in Spanish, you may choose Spanish. It will be important for you to make that selection so that you can hear all the panelists um, appropriately. 
If you want to hear switch languages, you can do that at any point throughout the presentation as well. So, bienvenidas. En este momento vamos a explicar la parte de la interpretación. Eh, vamos a tener interpretación en vivo de español a inglés e inglés a español y también en idiomas de señas. Entonces, para escuchar la interpretación al español o al inglés, por favor diríjase a la parte de abajo de su pantalla de Zoom y seleccione el idioma de su preferencia. Si es el español, selecciona el español. Si es el inglés, selecciona el inglés. Puede cambiar su selección en cualquier momento de, durante la programación, pero es importante que haga esa selección en este momento para que pueda escuchar a los panelistas um, apropiadamente. So, um, if you are joining through a phone, you might be able to select that option following, um, clicking on the dot, 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 and then following there, you will be able to see the language interpretation option and select your language there. Make sure to click done or finalize when you are done with that selection. Si usted nos acompaña utilizando un teléfono, puede también eh, presionar los tres puntitos que tal vez aparecen en la parte de arriba, derecha o baja derecha de la pantalla para abrir el menú y ahí puede seleccionar también el idioma de su preferencia. Muchas gracias y que tengan un buen evento. Thank you so much and have a great event. And Hello everyone, I am Ed Wingenbach, the president of Hampshire College. We begin by acknowledging that this event is being broadcast from unceded Pecumtuck land. We understand that naming this is not enough. We do this as a way of acknowledging and reminding ourselves about the land we occupy, and we know this act alone does not repair the damage done by colonialism. We want to acknowledge the Pecumtuck people, the original inhabitants of the land where we live and work, and the land that Hampshire College is on. Whether our individuals with Pecumtuck ancestry still here, the Pecumtuck people as a tribe are no longer here because of the ongoing violence at the hands of European colonization. Welcome Hampshire students, staff, faculty, our five college colleagues, alums, community, and friends. Thank you for participating in the 22nd annual Ekbo Ahmad lecture a symposium on race, empire, and state-sanctioned violence. I want to offer a special welcome to Julie Diamond, Akbal's wife, and Dora Ahmad, his daughter, who in the past has been unable to attend because of her teaching obligations. I also want to greet attendees from around the world who have been able to join us because of the remote format we were compelled to adopt this year. I'm grateful to the Akbal Ahmed Committee, including Uzma Aslam Khan, Amy Jordan, and Bruce Belinda Cardenas. Thank you for creating an inspiring and timely program, for integrating it into Engage, and for finding a way to move forward in the midst of an ongoing international pandemic. Thanks to our interpreters for ASL, Hampshire alums Joan Watman and Margaret Haberman, and for Spanish, Ruth Belinda Cardenas and Liliana Sierra. The slideshow is provided or was provided by Oren Herskowitz, Akbal's son-in-law, and Siraj Ali, the master of the Akbal Ahmad fan page. Finally, thanks to Rayanne Wentworth Kaju, who has provided extensive and generous technical assistance setting up the webinar. Someone is telling me that the Screen is blank in the chat. My video, I'm sorry, I'm checking. My video is on, so I will continue. This endowed lectureship honors the teaching, scholarship, and activism of the late Akbal Ahmad, a longtime Hampshire College professor. Professor Ahmad's faculty colleagues, former students, family, and friends from around the globe joined together to make this lecture series a continuing celebration of his life and work. It's an enduring legacy that honors the principles of the man for whom it is named, inspires us to reflect on the teacher's impact, and underscores the opportunity and obligation of every educator 
to make a difference for students, to infuse scholarship with activism, and to pursue justice. The lectureship brings to Hampshire College and our community distinguished scholars, political figures, nativists, and artists engaged with questions of social movements and social justice in both the United States and the post-colonial worlds in which Ekbal was engaged. Today's program exemplifies this goal. As a witness to global conflict, Ekbal devoted his life's work to writing, teaching, and above all else, working for change. Ekbal was a participant in and witness to some of the most harrowing times and political struggles of the 20th century. The partition of India and Pakistan and its legacies, the Algerian Revolution, the Vietnam War, the Middle East conflict, and the First Gulf War. His legacy, his experience, his commitment to activism, his scholarship, all represent Hampshire College at its best. While I did not know Akbal Ahmad, his thinking shaped me in ways I did not realize until coming to Hampshire. As I was reading his work and learning about his life for this event, I came to understand that Ekbal profoundly influenced many of the figures central to my own intellectual development. I was reminded of the, of the very first class I designed and taught myself, a seminar on radical political thought, given free reign to teach the texts that I thought would have the most transformative impact on students. I put together a syllabus dominated by people with whom Ekbal collaborated and who have spoken in this very lecture series, including Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Frederick Jameson, Judith Butler, Edward Said, Kimberly Crenshaw. I'm certain that I am not the only person who has been unknowingly shaped by Ekbal's influence. And I'm grateful to have this opportunity to learn about his legacy and for this lecture series that continues to reinforce and make visible his enduring impact. Part of this legacy is the astounding list of speakers that have visited Hampshire College to lead the Ekbal Ahmad Symposium, like Erndadi Roy, Tariq Ali, Michelle Alexander, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, Rashid Khalidi, Fahd Ahmad, and three co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Coolers, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. Today, Barbara Ransby, Jamila Hussein Shannon, and Francia Marquez joined this lineage. Margaret? Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm trying to channel the Robert Crown Center and imagine people pouring in, though we've begun to think that there are some advantages revealed by this mode of doing, of accommodating our situation, and that we should always have a remote option so that people can join the program from wherever they might be. So we begin today our program on transnational racial politics and solidarities beyond borders. Something that Ekbal understood in his heart and soul and something he engaged throughout the course of his life. Once when I was reading chronicles of the early civil rights movement, I came across the following unexpected note, quote, one day in 1966 in Mississippi, there was an incident on a public bus. One of the multitude of such incidents that accompanied the more dramatic and famous ones that have been preserved in historical memory. Quote, five black Americans and one Pakistani were forcibly removed for refusing to sit at the back of the bus. Well, I knew immediately who was that one Pakistani? And now you do too. Ekbal, his wife Julie told me, was likely in Mississippi in 1965 or 66 for an early anti-war teach-in in Jackson, joined by his friend Howard Zinn, who was then teaching in Tugaloo. Now that moment was echoed by another that happened a few years later in 1971, something that was partially captured in some of those amazing photographs that began the program. Um, at that moment, quote, four, excuse me, five radical Catholics and one Pakistani were arrested in a plot alleged by J. Edgar Hoover to kidnap Henry Kissinger. 
as a result of which they were sent to federal prison. And you see Ethbal behind bars in one of those slides actually smiling. A federal prison where I remember him telling me he was welcomed and protected by black Muslims organized on the inside. One other lesser known fact of Ethbal's life is that in 1957, on his first trip to the United States on a Rotary Scholarship to study history, he came to study history at Occidental College and wrote an undergraduate thesis on Native American resistance to settler colonialism. Now, how is it that Iqbal Ahmad became one of the first non-Native scholars of Native American history? Arriving to the United States in the 1950s, he once remarked, he was inundated by cowboy and Indian movies. And what he found himself always identifying with the Indians um, who never had names, never had histories, never had families. And it was that absence and those illegible histories that he determined to learn. And as he would often remind us, after all, Indian fighting was the deep model or template for US counterinsurgency policy. And finally, a remembrance from Pervase Hoodboy that I encountered recently and thought was particularly appropriate to today's program at the moment of Ekbal's death. As they finally wheeled him out of the intensive care unit, the nurse asked if you were my father. No, I said, he was the head of our clan. There was little point in explaining that this was no usual clan, has no blood linkages, knows no country, religion, or race. Its many thousand members are spread across the continents, from Vietnam to the West Bank and Morocco, from India and Pakistan to Europe and North America. Their only bond is a shared belief in human dignity, justice, liberty, and all that is rich and precious in human experience. Race, empire and state sanctioned violence. It's my privilege to open the program today where we're honored to have talks from three women very much in Ekbal's tradition, who've spoken, written and acted fearlessly and with tremendous insight, deconstructing the rhetorics of power and standing with those who suffer and resist oppression. All three deeply involved in activism and committed to solidarity beyond borders. A Hampshire faculty member will present each of our speakers in turn. First, Amy Jordan, professor of African American history and co dean of institutional diversity and inclusion, will introduce Barbara Ransby. And one, la one last thing, uh, one last technical detail is that we welcome you to participate in the chat either writing to one of the panelists or to everyone. And that's for sort of social stuff. We're happy to hear where you might be tuning in from. But the Q&A is precisely for questions. And we will, you, you're welcome to also put questions in throughout the, the program and we'll compile them and address them at the end. So now, again, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Amy. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Ransby is the author of two award-winning books, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, and Islanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. She's also the author of a third book published in August of 2018, entitled Mrs. Paul, Ro excuse me, entitled Islanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. Um, and I should mention that my students said that was the best biography they ever read. She's also author of a third book published in August 2018 entitled Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. She's also the editor-in-chief of Souls, a critical journal of Black politics, culture, and society, and is a member of the editorial working group of the London-based journal Race and Class and the editorial advisory board of the Justice, Politics, and Power book series at the University of North Carolina Press. 
I met Barbara Ramsey when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan in the early 1990s. She was in the process of moving to Chicago and working on her dissertation on Ella Baker. Many of the scholar activists I had the pleasure of studying, strategizing, and organizing with during my time at the University of Michigan had already been carefully mentored by Dr. Ramsey. Deeply involved in the anti-apartheid free South African movement of the 1980s and a central leader in the anti-racism student movement of the late 1980s, Dr. Ransby was critical in formulating the demands which resulted in the Ella Baker Nelson Mandela Center. Situated in the University of Michigan Central Campus, it provided an activist resource center, a place where campus and community activists could read and a read about historical and contemporary progressive social movements, gather together and hold organizing meetings. Dr. Ramsby is one of many progressive activists who's inspired by Ella Baker's activism, which centered leadership development, eschewed charismatic leadership styles, I'm noticing the Michigan alums, <laughs> and highlighted group-centered organizing approaches. In 1991, during the Senate hearings uh, regarding the nomination for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, Thomas claimed that the allegations of sexual harassment uh, by Anita Hill constituted a high-tech lynching. Dr. Ransby and other progressive African-American women scholars produced a collectively funded letter published in the New York Times entitled African-American Women in Defense of Ourselves. This letter challenged Thomas's sexist invoking of lynching and insisted that the Senate Judici Judiciary Committee's handling of the hearing obscured the historical impact of racial violence directed at African-American women. These are just a few of the examples of Dr. Ransby's scholar activism that informed my own sense of how historians can produce scholarship that facilitates political education, institutional development, and relationship building. Uh, relationship building in support of social movements. This can be seen most recently in her aptly entitled book, Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. Dr. Ramsby applies her insightful analytical lens to the lived experiences of the dynamic group of activists who are leading the Black Lives Matter movement and movement for, for Black Lives. In this study, Ransby highlights the transformative nature of this movement, the intricacies and challenges of grassroots organizing, and the creation of regional, national, and international networks of solidarity. Most importantly, Ransby reveals the ways in which the movement for Black lives is powerfully informed by a Black feminist politics, an international, intersectional analysis, a group-centered leadership style, and a praxis that centers the experiences and leadership of queer and transgender communities. Today, Barbara Ransby is the John D. MacArthur Chair and Distinguished Professor in the Departments of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She also directs the Campus-Wide Social Justice Initiative, a project that promotes connections between academics and community organizers during work on social justice. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Barbara Ramsby. Thank you for that um, wonderful introduction, uh, Amy, Dr. Amy Jordan, my um, friend and, and colleague for many years. Uh, I'm so happy to be here at Hampshire, uh, even virtually, uh, for this um, important annual lecture. I'm happy to share the platform with uh, Jamila uh, Shannon and Francia Marquez, um, and just uh, you know, very pleased to, to be a part of something honoring uh, Ekbal Ahmad. Uh, I appreciate the presence of his family. I had the honor to be affiliated with Ekbal as a fellow member of the editorial working committee of the London-based journal Race and Class. 
Um, we overlapped by a short period of time, but his reputation loomed large. And as uh, Dr. Jordan said, I come to you as a historian and an activist for over 40 years. So my um, activist commitments are very much in the forefront of my mind as I share my remarks with you today. Uh, what I wanna talk about today, and I won't take too much time because I really want us to have time for conversation and I'm certainly eager to hear my co-panelists. I wanna talk a little bit about race, empire uh, and state sanctioned violence in two parts. First, I wanna talk about the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial um, and internationalist tradition within the US black freedom movement. It's a part of the US black radical tradition that often gets overlooked. Uh, and secondly, I wanna talk about uh, how racist state violence in the US uh, manifests and how the current movement um, is in fact addressing it. So when we talk about the US as a nation state or even the US left, uh, uh, black politics, particularly black left politics often get left out of the mix or are skewed and tumbled inside the mix. Uh, even last year when we had all kinds of mobilizations and a growing uh, progressive movement, there was a major struggle around how we understand the nexus between race and class. But what I wanna say is that there is indeed a rich, longstanding and vibrant black radical tradition and a growing body of work that analyzes it. At the center of that tradition is opposition to empire, colonialism, war and state violence. So the history of black resistance to empire and black internationalism is indeed long. Uh, we can say perhaps it began with the cultural carryovers that enslaved people brought with them in the form of language and stories and traditions and the fierce determination to remember. Uh, we can also look back to the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements. I was just reading uh, David Blight's uh, wonderful tome on Frederick Douglass and being reminded of the kind of international reputation and frame that Frederick Douglass operated in. And of course, uh, someone like Ida B. Wells uh, doing her anti-lynching work uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century on not just the national stage, but on a global stage, condemning white supremacy uh, and state violence in that era. Now I mentioned Wells because black women have been key in foregrounding black internationalism and key fighters in opposition uh, to state sanctioned violence. I write about Ella Baker uh, in the 1930s standing in solidarity with the Ethiopian resistance to the 1935 uh, Italian invasion and occupation. She was in Harlem at the time, but she knew at that time that her struggle went beyond Harlem. She always asked the question, who are your people? And on one level, you might think she's asking a very parochial question. Uh, a question about lineage, an essentialist question, but quite the opposite. She means it in the most capacious sense. She means who do you claim and who claims you? Who are you fighting to make the world better for? Who are you standing in solidarity with? In my research on the life and work of Islanda Cardoza Good Robeson, uh, somewhat, somewhat of a contemporary of Ella Baker's, um, and, and Essie Robeson is known as the wife of uh, the radical activist and artist Paul Robeson, but it's really a shame that she, uh, her, her legacy has been so much in his shadows because um, she lived an amazing life and, and was a true world citizen in a way. Uh, she lent her energy, her brilliance, her talent to the fight against colonialism in Africa and around the world. She wrote, she organized, she raised funds, she traveled to every corner of the globe and um, her story is only one uh, among many. I'm so glad that over the last uh, decade or so, there is a whole generation of new scholars who are writing about uh, Black internationalism. Eric McDuffie, Dale Gore, uh, Annette Joseph Gabriel, Keisha Blaine. Um, and I really wanna highlight um, Adam Getachew's new book, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall uh, of Self-Determination, in which she talks about African independence leaders uh, and their impact, not just on the African continent, uh, but on the world. So when we think, uh, still thinking historically, when we think of black internationalism uh, and black resistance to empire in the 1960s and 70s, there are numerous examples. We can look to groups like the Black Panther Party, which more, uh, which more and more people are indeed writing about, particularly writing about women and gender uh, in the Black Panther Party. 
Uh, but not only did the Panthers address issues of police violence at the community level, at the street level, but the Panthers really had a very global view. They borrowed lessons from the Chinese Revolution and anti-colonial struggles around the world. They participated in and received international delegations. And when the struggle sharpened, Black Panther uh, leaders found refuge in other countries because of the international uh, solidarity they had built. Of course, Asada Shakur uh, was then working with the Black Liberation Army, uh, found refuge in Cuba, uh, Eldridge and Kathleen Cleaver for a time in Algeria. And then there are organizations like SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a group that Ella Baker uh, co-founded. SNCC emerged out of the desegregation sit-ins in the early 1960s, but as it evolved, it did not confine its work or its analysis to the U.S. South or to the U.S. borders. SNCC leaders, including Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer and Julian Bond, uh, John Lewis, Ruby Doris Smith Robinson, a total of 11 uh, SNCC members constituted a historic delegation in 1964 uh, that went to the African continent, particularly to Guinea, uh, to learn about African independence, to learn about uh, uh, Pan-Africanism on the continent. In 1966, SNCC was widely criticized for taking a principled stand against the war in Vietnam, a year before Dr. King took a similar stance and similar criticism. They maintained relations with many African liberation organizations. And of course, SNCC chairperson uh, following jo uh, John Lewis was uh, Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture, who went on to form the All African People's Revolutionary Party, uh, spending much of the rest of his life uh, on the African continent. So movements that we sometimes see and frame and misdefine as very national, very confined to national borders, very parochial, um, you know, are in fact, um, very internationalism. And, and that's a tradition that contemporary activists have identified with, embraced, and built upon. As Dr. Jordan mentioned, uh, my last book was on the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for Black Lives. <clears throat> I wrote that book as a participant activist, uh, spending several years um, in meetings and conferences and rallies and demonstrations uh, with organizations like the Black Youth Project 100, Black Lives Matter, Dream Defenders in Florida, and now the Movement for Black Lives Coalition. And, and let me just say parenthetically, you know, we talk about Black Lives Matter as a kind of shorthand, uh, but Black Lives Matter is a, is a very large term uh, that really consists of an ecosystem of organizations, national and local organizations, not just the Black Lives Matter organization or network, um, which emerged out of that moment. Uh, but a myriad of other organizations, uh, many of them working in collaboration. In the 2016 document, The Vision for Black Lives, it was a vast progressive document that defined state violence in very large and holistic terms. It was about police violence to be sure, but it was also about housing and jobs and economic justice and climate and reproductive justice uh, and health care. More recently, uh, the Movement for Black Lives has crafted an omnibus bill that they're calling the Breathe Act. And that bill talks about, again, not only police violence, not only abolition and defunding of uh, police forces, but also what we have to build, uh, build infrastructure, build uh, jobs programs, build um, access to healthcare. Uh, so it is also this large notion of what state violence it actually means, right? State violence is not just um, um, a police bullet or is not just uh, the neck of, uh, of a violent uh, law enforcement officer on a black man's uh, back, but it is in fact the daily violence that people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others endured and that their communities and families endured. And so our response to state violence is not a response, response to events, but response to systems and longstanding practices. Similarly, the Red, Black, and Green New Deal, which has been championed by people like Colette Pichon Battle and her colleagues at the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, is centering uh, climate change and cl centering climate justice in the context of an anti racist Black liberation uh, struggle. All of these documents speak to state violence in the broadest sense. 
But what I also want to say about this generation of activists, like Eckball, they are overwhelmingly and unapologetically internationalists. Their documents, speeches, and platforms speak to global systems and speak solidarity to struggles from Brazil to Haiti to South Africa to Palestine. In fact, it is the issue of Palestine uh, around which many of these organizations in the Black Lives Matter network, in the movement for Black Lives, um, have been criticized and in fact taken some blows and taken some hits uh, from funders, but indeed a principal stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people uh, has been the path that, uh, that they chose and it's a cause for great, um, great optimism. So um, what, what I want to say uh, in, in the next part of my remarks is to really um, to talk a little bit about our challenges today. I've spoken about the need to have a large and encompassing notion of state violence, right? The state violence is violent foreign policies, which we've certainly seen and continue to see around the world, but violence is also uh, economic policies at home and police policies at home, often tied to military training, to military weapon. We saw that on the streets of Ferguson. Uh, so that large uh, frame for understanding state violence is critical to mapping a liberatory agenda going forward. Clearly, uh, the Black protests, the Black-led protests, I should say, uh, over the past uh, seven years or so, has understood state violence as a critical, a critical component of a black freedom agenda for a freedom agenda. We saw in response to uh, George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis uh, in May of last year, over 26 million people, 26 million people in the middle of a pandemic choosing to march, rally and protest police violence. Now, Rashad Robinson at uh, Color of Change has argued that you know, anti-racism is perhaps becoming a majoritarian issue. I think we have a lot of work to do, but I wanna also lean into that optimism. What contemporary black freedom movements in their largest and best manifestations in their internationalism, in their refusal to throw any group under the bus, in their rejection of narrow identity politics, narrow nationalism, uh, what they represent is a hopeful vision, not only for black communities, uh, but for all of us, right? Uh, some of the founders of the Black Lives Matter hashtag that, um, that were cited before, and I think some have been speakers at Hampshire, you know, have, have talked about this proposition that when all black people are free, uh, all people will be free. Now that might sound like a divisive statement, but when you think of what anti-blackness has represented in, the, in colonialism in the world and the justification for colonialism throughout the world, what anti-blackness has represented in terms of um, hierarchies of oppression and institutionalized violence in this country. And when you think of a movement that rejects the politics of respectability, which says some black folks are okay, but black folks who are in the underground economy, black sex workers, black trans folks, black poor people uh, have to fend for themselves. Rejecting that is a radically inclusive proposition that has enormous, enormous promise uh, for social transformation uh, as we look forward. So, you know, in my work over the last number of years with this iteration of the Black Freedom Movement, you know, I'm seeing the need to. Uh, speak out in solidarity with young people who are fighting on the streets of Pretoria and Johannesburg as we speak, um, enduring rubber, rubber bullets from the South African government, the need to speak out against the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, the need to continue to speak out against the Israeli uh, occupation uh, of Palestine. And that is a seamless voice. That is a seamless voice, very much uh, in the tradition of the Islanda Robesons uh, and Ella Bakers uh, of the world, the Stokely Carmichaels and Ruby Doris Smith Robinson. So um, we have much work to do. We are in the, what Dr. King will call the fierce urgency of now. And in, at the end of his life, you know, uh, every 
January, we remember Dr. King, but we often remember him in such uh, narrow terms that he would not be recognizable to himself. But where he was at the end of his life was understanding um, the need for radical uh, systemic change, understanding the need to frame the Black liberation struggle uh, in global terms. And I'm so um, hopeful in hearing the voices of young activists today um, embrace that radical Dr. King um, as they you know, lend solidarity to these struggles around the world and as they indeed uh, uh, develop chants and demands and documents and manifestos you know, that, that represent a, a very uh, broad, humane and radically democratic vision uh, of a movement and of a new society. So as we continue this conversation, um, you know, we have to remember that those of us in the academy are not insulated from the world. You know, sometimes we, we get training that suggests we ought to be, and certainly the people reminding us uh, the most that we have to be in the world and of the world and speaking to the injustices in the world um, are our students. So to the students uh, who are listening, um, don't shy away from activism. Don't shy away from taking strong positions. And you don't have to figure everything out before you take a position on something, before you attempt to organize around something uh, that you see as unjust in your community uh, and certainly in the larger world. And uh, also encouraging you as you define who your people are, uh, that you define that as a an international, a multilingual pop proposition uh, and one that uh, will be very much in solidarity to fights that are going on parallel to the struggles in this country um, all over the world. So I'll end with a um, slogan that has resonated around the world and very much in the spirit of our brother, Iqbal Ahmad, um, Aluta Continua. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Barbara. And now I present you with my colleague, Usma Aslam Khan, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Dr. Barbara Ransby, for your incredibly powerful remarks. Hello to all our participants and welcome. My name is Usma Aslam Khan, and I'm a faculty at Hampshire College. I'm absolutely thrilled to be in the presence of this amazing panel of three extraordinary women and to have the honor of introducing our next speaker. Dr. Jamila Hussain Shanan is a scholar and educator, activist and public speaker dedicated to socioeconomic and political justice. Though not in Dr. Hussain's official bio, I must add, she is also a mesmerizing storyteller. I first heard her speak on a panel on intersectional feminism and Palestine some years ago, and I was reminded of Iqbal. This is before I knew that the two had known each other and been in conversation with each other, how I wish I could have been a fly on the wall back then. That day, while listening to Dr. Hussain speak, I was thinking of Iqbal because I frequently do. I never stopped being the teenager in Pakistan who looked up to him, for his very own holistic, analytical, and spiritual mix of writing, teaching, and direct action, as we have been hearing. I won't repeat that. But I will say that it is, you know, this mix that 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 has stayed with me my whole life, um, because it is through this that he was able to challenge the manufacturing of an other across communities, not only in Pakistan and South Asia, across communities, across nationalities. But that day I was also thinking of him because of what he said in the 1990s after the war in Bosnia, when white dominated women's movements in the US were quiet about war crimes and quiet about the ways in which racial and ethnic violence uniquely impact women. Decades ago, Iqbal had warned of the dangers of the erosion of the value in drawing local and global links between anti-racist, anti-war, and anti-imperialist struggles. He said, resistance strategies, I'm quoting him, resistance strategies presuppose a constituency of resistance, end quote. 
and resistance strategies had done this in the 60s and 70s. Then after the war in Bosnia, he asked where these constituencies were and urgently called for a consciousness of international solidarity to be, as he put it, rehabilitated. Well, here is a constituency today and um, I think Iqbal would be very pleased and I feel his presence among us. So after that day, I first heard Dr. Hussain speak. I had the privilege of learning more. And as I said, I learned that she is a natural born storyteller, one with a rare capacity to effortlessly draw on a wealth of embodied lived experience across three continents, generously, fiercely, to visibilize that which is dehumanized, that which is invisibilized, when it doesn't fit into a predetermined frame. Her work examines how matrices of oppression and liberation operate in the context of settler colonialism and anti-Black racism. It examines education as an empowering project. She teaches at the graduate level on the intricate relationship between language, power, and injustice, justice, critical race theory, the institutionalization of oppression and liberation. She has designed, directed, and taught academic programs for teachers in Boston, at Harvard University, Boston College, Goddard College, Lesley University, UMass Boston, and also internationally in Morocco, Jordan, Spain, Palestine, Mexico, and the Balkans. Focusing on schools, her courses interrogate the role of teachers and students in cultivating their political clarity to engage in liberation work toward justice. Prior her, to her doctorate, Dr. Hussain founded and ran Yamita Activity Center for Children, co-founded the Teacher Creativity Center, and worked for Defense for Ch Children International, all in Palestine. A Palestinian born in Colombia and raised in Jerusalem, Dr. Hussain is fluent in Spanish, Arabic, and English. After spending 23 years in the US, she is currently back home in Palestine from where she joins us to our immense honor. Thank you so much, Uzma, for this introduction. I actually remember the day we met and we talked about uh, maybe an invitation um, for me to come to Hampshire College. So in some ways, um, it's good that we're doing it in, on Zoom because I'm currently in Palestine and it's currently 11 p.m. for me. So it works fine. Um, I, I, um, I just want to start, maybe this will get me a little bit more focused. Um, I, the honor I feel to being invited to uh, a conversation uh, in, in, um, in memory of Dr. Iqbal Ahmed, I, I, I just can't describe it. I, I only met him a couple of times. I was um, a relatively uh, young activist. We were, um, we put together a series of talks and we invited, you know, uh, all the great people of his generation and he stood out to me. He, um, I mean, like everybody else, he had this incredible deep analysis and he, um, he was so down to earth. He was so real. He was, um, when he talked to us about Palestine and he said, we should do this, I believed him. I saw him as part of that we. He taught me that we has many, many, many different meanings. And as I continued uh, uh, engaging the work, I was lucky enough to also meet with him a couple of times and he challenged me tremendously. I still, I'm still thinking about some of the um, questions that he brought up about Palestine and our rhetoric of armed struggle and whether what we had was actually a revolution. He, he wasn't uh, feeling goody touchy. He, he challenged you in the most loving, generous, gracious ways. So um, yes, thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you, Dr. Um, Ransby for uh, your presentation. I actually, 
as you were speaking, I've been scratching off some of my notes because I don't need to repeat it. Um, so then I can focus a little bit on some of the other um, aspects that I wanted to focus on. As Uzma said in the introduction, I've lived in different continents. So I entered this conversation from the experience of a Palestinian, whether I was in Colombia with my family, in Palestine or in the US, I've always felt and experienced the world and as a Palestinian. I understand the world through the lens of Palestine. I don't limit myself to that lens. So the years that I spent in the United States, I got the chance, uh, I'm being told to slow down. Uh, I apologize, uh, translation is very important and I will slow down. Um, being in the United States for 23 years, uh, engaging in um, what for me felt uh, the only thing to do in Palestine, I was both looking for Palestinians, fighting for Palestine, and also looking to connect with indigenous um, people. I didn't really understand much about racism, let alone anti-blackness um, in, its, in its own way. And I uh, quickly looked for and um, started um, engaging with uh, other, with indigenous people of uh, the lands of uh, Turtle Island. Gradually, as I understood the US context and I started understanding better anti-blackness, I, I started understanding myself better. It wasn't simply a matter of, uh, I am there to help them. To me, the struggle in the United States of indigenous and black people felt in some ways an extension of a part of my own struggle in Palestine for Palestine. So I understand state violence through that lens. When I um, was introduced to uh, Kwame Ture, and when I heard Malcolm X and Angela Davis and Cornel West talk about Palestine, there is a part of me that felt confirmed. I had been on the verge of being convinced that maybe we Palestinians are just, there's something wrong with us. The whole world says something and we insist on something else. We say, Ya Jama'a, this is colonization. And they tell us, no, 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 you have to fight for human rights. And we say, no, our fight is a fight to decolonize. So I was at that relatively young age starting to doubt myself. They had just signed what they called peace agreements. And then the whole world is telling us, this is good for you, you have peace now. But it, it's not good, like we know it's not good. So hearing indigenous and black scholars and uh, activists talk about Palestine, seeing it the way that they were seeing it was also very reaffirming and confirming for me. Hearing and learning how they analyze the context in the United States and how they make sense of, of it also helped me further understand how racism is deeply embedded in Israel. Israel and the United States, both settler colonial states, share a lot in common. They um, are violent in nature, like all colonial enterprises. Uh, and they both rely on what Iqbal Ahmed uh, calls ghosts and missions in order to justify their violence. They need a ghost, a divine uh, intervention, a, a mission, it's manifest destiny, and it's the chosen people and the promised land, and then a ghost. So you, you look at them ideologically, the supremacist ideologies behind both of them, whether it's white supremacy in the United States or Jewish supremacy in uh, the Zionist entity, which has been enshrined in their Supreme Court. You look at the practices, you look at the violence uh, against indigenous and black people. Um, and like Dr. Ransby said, state violence is structural, is institutional, poverty, in, in healthcare, in the education system, in every way you see it, state violence, it hurts us a lot um, in every single day. Now, when state violence is enacted on the bodies of black people sleeping and shopping and playing, 
uh, when it's enacted on the bodies of indigenous women who are disappeared and um, you know, not much is done about it, uh, we take to the streets. And um, it gives us an opportunity to uh, articulate and express our pain, our joint solidarity, and our rejection, our refusal to state violence. Yet, it is also important that we understand that state violence in the United States and Israel, for example, it's not a, an exception. It's not like we're looking to go back to normal, like sometimes people say, it is the norm. Settler states are what they are, where they are, because they are violent. It's not that they were violent in the beginning and then they became something else. The state itself is violent. The only entity in the world that enjoys international legitimacy to use force is the state. The state is required to have an army. It's required to have cops. It, 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 that's what it does. The state does that. It's violent. So in Palestine, for example, when the news uh, arrived about the killing of George Floyd, Palestinians only a few days back had been dealing with the murder of uh, Iyad Halak, a 34-year-old um, man in Jerusalem, killed by the Israeli police in Jerusalem. Um, he ran, they shot at him, he hid in a garbage room in a school, and they shot him dead. So at that moment, there is that solidarity that's based on, I hear you, I feel you, I recognize that pain. And that's not enough to sustain a solidarity that will take us to liberation. Yes, shared struggle, shared oppression is definitely um, takes us a step further into the possibilities of building solidarities with each other. And we still need to continue understanding each other, learning from each other and growing to together. And in here, I'm going back to um, Dr. Iqbal Ahmed. As much as he talked against and about empire and um, colonialism and um, imperialism, he also emphasized something. This is one of the things that I definitely took from him. He emphasized the arduous yet quite often creative, visionary, and life affirming forms of resistance that people all over the world. Um, engage in against empire, violence, and colonialism. For those of us fighting for justice, we need to have um, enough clarity, again, uh, to what Dr. Nasby was saying. Uh, we need to know exactly what it is we're fighting against and what we're fighting for. In other words, to use Freire's terminology, we need to know what it is that we announce and what it is that we denounce. And in that, uh, uh, in that respect, I think it is very important that we um, are clear on when we are, um, what it is that we call a victory. State violence, structural, institutional, inherit in settler colonial states is not gonna change with a reform here and a reform there. In order for us to end state violence, in order for us to end the targeting of black people, of indigenous communities, in order for us to save the environment, in order for us to ensure uh, decent healthcare, employment, um, in order for us to get the banks and the corporations of our blacks or backs who are sucking our blood and literally, literally, stealing the money of the poor. This all needs to happen together. So what we need is a transformative process. What we need, I would argue, is a revolution or maybe multiple revolutions. Talking about colonialism, describing decolonization, Franz Fanon uh, very uh, almost casually says, 
decolonization cannot be accomplished, and I quote, cannot be accomplished by the wave of a magic wand, a natural cataclysm, or a gentleman's agreement. It's not that simple. It requires a disordering of the order that the state insists on. What is it that they talk to us about uh, law and order? Yes, they mean it. They're talking about maintaining the order. Our job is to disorder it and to reorder things and to reimagine, to reinvent and to try to, to, to think of what is possible beyond what we have been experiencing in our generations. And to Dr. Ranspin's point, the movement for black lives is doing precisely that. The, the policy documents that they are putting forth are uh, gradually building on a collective knowledge of over 50 black organizations in the United States. And they are work, working in that direction. That's what they're trying to do. So the goal is not to get rid of white cops in order to then appoint black and brown cops. The goal is not reform. The goal is abolition. Abolition, full abolition. Abolition of police, abolition of prisons. The problem with prisons is not simply that they are private and they make profit off of them, which is definitely um, just one more indication of, of uh, the values that sustain systems like the United States and Israel. But the issue is control of human bodies and the stifling of any possibility for liberation and for movements. And in here, again, Iqbal Ahmad uh, comes uh, to my rescue and helps me understand what do I mean by revolution. Revolution for Iqbal Ahmad, when he was um, in his critique of the uh, Palestinian Liberation uh, Organization and uh, this whole rhetoric and um, imagery of armed struggle, one of the things that he explained is that the role of the revolution is not to outfight the adversary, especially that in our case, we Palestinians do not have and will never have the military power of uh, the Zionist uh, regime. Um, and even if we did, in order for us to acquire such military power, we would be probably selling our soul in the process. So revolution, he explains, for Palestinians and maybe more in general, should not aim to outfight the energy but rather to out-administer them, to out-organize them, in order to out-legitimize them by identifying and exposing their primary contradictions. And I quote, so the primary task of the revolutionary struggle is to achieve the moral isolation of the adversary in its own eyes and in the eyes of the world. And this is what we're seeing uh, happening now. This is uh, just like uh, Zionist hegemony and white supremacy have uh, intensified their form of um, I'm sorry, I just heard the Spanish translation, so I'm not sure what happened. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, it, it's happening again. For some reason, I'm hearing the Spanish translation and it's distracting me. Um, I, I will, I saw somebody in the, uh, ask for the quote. I will, I will put the quote in the chat um, again when, when I finish. So um, just gonna read it again, see if I can gather my thoughts um, again. So uh, again, this is a quote from Iqbal. So the primary task of the revolutionary struggle is to achieve the moral isolation of the adversary in its own eyes and in the eyes of the world. And this is what we see the movement for black lives, for example, engaged in, because you, you are eyewitness in the United States through the work that I do with teachers, with students and in other areas, I've been witnessing uh, more and more white people uh, um, 
I can hear the translation. Hello, could we just stop for one minute? Um, the translation, the Spanish translation is um, being heard. Is there some way we can adjust that channel? Ray Ann, are you? I can see that the account Rose is using is on the English channel, and I believe it should be on the Spanish channel. I believe that will correct it. Okay, Rose, have you got that? Shall we try? Shall Let's we try? try again. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Rose, you're good. Please proceed and we apologize. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I just lost my train of thought. Uh, so uh, the movement for Barak Lives, uh, the uh, Palestinian call for BDS for boycott, divestment and sanctions in the US is creating a shift. And I do think that it is uh, breaking through Zionist and white supremacist hegemony. And I think that's why uh, we, we see it in mass communication, especially the attempts to control social media. Um, you see Facebook trying, for example, to, to ban any criticism of Israel and Zionism, um, which I find um, telling. It's telling, they are scared. They are trying to protect their lives. And because you see, the way settler colonialist uh, states uh, function is um, the, the, the lie of democracy, you know? So it, it's, they're doing everything. They attacked Iraq in the name of democracy because the US that apparently knows enough about democracy is going to spread democracy in the Arab world, including Iraq. Israel keeps talking about itself as the only democracy in the, in, in the Middle East. And a, a lot of people believe this. So when, when we talk about Russia, nobody is pretending, Russia itself is not pretending to be a democracy. So it's easier for us to see. So like the movement for black lives, uh, the BDS, the uh, Idle No More, what we saw in Standing Rock, what we saw in Ferguson is actually forcing the empire to show its ugly teeth. And this is one of the ways that I understand Iqbal's understanding of the revolution. The revolution not only points the contradictions within the empire, but also um, creates uh, the context for the moral isolation of the adversary in its own eyes and in the eyes of the world. Now, it brings me to a very important point that I think uh, we often don't, um, I, I haven't heard us discuss enough. We talk about the importance of what we denounce and what we renounce, what it is we're fighting against and what it is we're fighting for. I think we also need to talk about what we need to renounce. What do we need to give up in the process? We have grown in systems that are violent, oppressive. We've had to survive. We have engaged in struggle and we have internalized and accepted certain premises that the empire told us about ourselves and about others. And we need to consciously work on those ideas, those premises that we have internalized, those notions that we have accepted as normal, those uh, namings, those definitions. And we need to be ready to let go, not only of these ideas, but also of practices that are attached to it. So for the revolution, again, Iqbal Ahmed in uh, what I think is one of the most brilliant pieces that I could read about um, the topic tells us that you know, we might be, uh, uh, you might have a revolution that is radical, but wrong. 
um, being radical and being transformative doesn't necessarily mean that we are um, headed in the right direction. And here's where I wanna emphasize the question of values. We need to be clear, what values are we grounded in? What values are informing our, um, our struggle, our liberation movement? What values do we need to revisit and reclaim? Which values do we need to question and interrogate? Because at the end of the, the day, values are heavily influenced by political, social, and economic systems and structures. So in the United States, individualism, uh, competition, um, uh, this question of efficiency and efficacy. And sometimes I've been in, in activist spaces that act as if the revolution is um, a plan, just like the corporation has plans. We're supposed to have a plan with a beginning and an end and timelines and benchmarks and, you know, a lot of the language of the nonprofit industrial complex and um, I get it, we need to start somewhere. We start from where we are, we start from what we know. And we also need to accept that um, we need to change and challenge our values, our relationships to each other, our relationship to the land, to the environment. A revolution that doesn't explicitly pay attention to values might be radical, but wrong. For those of us uh, who believe in the possibility of justice and are willing to fight for it, Iqbal Ahmed urges us to hold on to our impatience for change. We need to be, as Freire says, patiently impatient. And we insist on absolute national sovereignty as indigenous people, on getting rid of any foreign occupations of our lands and, uh, and ending the world of anti-blackness, of sexism, of homophobia, of all of these, they go together. I do agree with Dr. Jansby. When black people are free, we will all be free. The, the centrality of anti-blackness to all the colonial pro project and to imperialism cannot be overemphasized. So if anybody, and I, I find myself sometimes when um, some people with very good intentions, I think, um, are uh, actively engaged in what they call Palestine solidarity work. And I asked the person, as a white person, you are doing Palestine solidarity work, what are you doing to uh, eradicate anti-blackness? Because if you are not engaged in uh, the struggle for black liberation as a white American, um, I, I have difficulties believing and trusting that you actually know how to support my struggle when you enter into solidarity with Palestinians. Um, and this is not, I'm not saying it as a critique. I am saying that this is something that we need to incorporate in the work, in the struggle. When we say revolution, we also need to be revolutionized. And I go back to Iqbal Ahmed, um, and I'm not gonna try to paraphrase. I'm just gonna read um, a direct quote by Iqbal. And he writes, Collectives of oppressed people discover themselves, their strengths and their humanity through struggle. If you don't resist, you don't struggle, you don't discover it. You don't even discover your own humanity, much less that of others, if you don't resist, if you don't struggle. So it is through struggle that we uh, transform ourselves, learn about each other, learn more about ourselves through each other, and rediscover ourselves and get in touch with our values. A lot of times we say we fight for the people and we don't really show enough respect for the people in whose name we say we are fighting. We need to reconnect, we need to reinvent, we need to reimagine. When capitalism and racism and colonialism and imperialism all put their hands together to do what they are doing against us and we take to the streets, they tell us, oh no, 
the banks are too big to fail. And wait a minute, the police is too important to jail. And we say in return, well, we are too strong and we will prevail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamila. It's hard to go so quickly from one to another um, without time to absorb your powerful remarks. But I will now introduce my colleague, Rose Belinda Cardenas, Professor of Latin American Studies and Anthropology, who will introduce Francia Marquez. Is Rose um, in the house? I, I think you may have to disentangle from your interpreter's um, role. Yeah, I see Rose. Are, are you about to speak, Rose? You know we can't hear you, right? Yeah. I think we're just waiting a moment for Rose. So I'll take the time to invite you to put any questions or issues that you would like the panelists to discuss into the Q&A. So it looks as though um, Rose is getting her equipment on and will be joining us in a second. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can yes, hear you. But there appears to be a little. Buenas tardes. Creo que hay un problema. Rose, I believe your first account is back on English. Ahora. There's still river. Hola. Mejor. That's good.
you're back to muted. Listo. Estamos listos entonces. Buenas tardes. En línea con la justicia del lenguaje, quiero hacer esta presentación de Francia en español. Tuve el privilegio de conocer a Francia Márquez en agosto de 2009, cuando fui intérprete de una activista afroamericana que vive en California y que estaba de viaje por el suroccidente de Colombia tratando de desentrañar las conexiones entre la criminalización de las comunidades de color en Estados Unidos y la violencia legitimada por la llamada guerra contra las drogas en países del extranjero. Una violencia que estaba desplazando y matando de forma desproporcionada a las personas negras en Colombia. Mientras desayunaba en una cafetería en una esquina del municipio de Suárez, Cauca, no muy lejos de su Yolombó natal, me enteré que su comunidad, tradicionalmente dedicada a la minería artesanal de oro, estaba luchando contra una orden de desalojo. El gobierno había concedido a personas que no pertenecían a la comunidad una licencia para llevar a cabo explotación de oro a gran escala en las tierras donde sus antepasados habían vivido desde 1635. Al instante quedé cautivada por la, clarición, la claridad de la visión política de Francia y por la amistad sincera que me ofreció. Por supuesto, me mantuve en contacto con ella una vez volví a Bogotá y un año más tarde vino a visitarme mientras planeábamos su primer viaje internacional para reunirse con Angela Davis y otras activistas en Estados Unidos con el objetivo de construir la solidaridad diaspórica. A los 28 años, Francia era ya una activista experimentada. Había luchado incansablemente por sus ríos, por su pueblo y por una política de la vida. Comprendía las redes transnacionales imperiales y sus formas de violencia racializadas, así como el poder de construir solidaridades más allá de las fronteras. Todo esto lo entendió a partir de su experiencia de vida como mujer negra, como madre soltera, como una niña que, crió en una, que creció en una zona rural empobrecida, ubicada en los márgenes del poder político y en el centro de la explotación capitalista. Más de una década después, Incluso ahora que se ha convertido en una figura con reconocimiento mundial, por ejemplo, recibió el premio medioambiental Goldman en, mil, en 2018, fue nombrada como una de las 100 mujeres más influyentes por la BBC en 2019 y recientemente anunció su candidatura presidencial para las elecciones de 2022 en Colombia. Repito, más de una década después, la mirada de Francia es inquebrantable. A lo largo de los años y mientras nos seguimos visitando aquí y allá, he aprendido muchas cosas de Francia, pero hay dos especialmente importantes que quisiera destacar. Francia, quien ha vivido entre personas cuyas vidas han estado sistemática e intencionalmente amenazadas, me ha enseñado en clara resonancia con el movimiento diaspórico por las vidas negras que debemos deshacer la política de la muerte en todas sus formas. En su práctica diaria y en su visión política, es un modelo para cultivar el cuidado de la vida. En segundo lugar, y aunque es plenamente consciente del papel del Estado en la creación y perpetuación de los sistemas de opresión, Francia me ha enseñado la importancia de luchar a dos manos. Hacer sin descanso demandas al Estado y cultivar comunidades políticas de lucha más allá de y en contra del Estado. Francia, para mí es un privilegio y un honor darte la bienvenida a nuestra comunidad en Hampshire College. Esperamos que aquí encuentres otro hogar. Gracias por acompañarnos hoy desde el suroccidente colombiano. Muchas gracias, Rosbelinda, por la amistad, por la hermandad por la solidaridad que hemos podido ir tejiendo durante muchos años, gracias eh, a la universidad eh, por invitarme a, 
participar de esta importante conmemoración de la vida de una persona que por supuesto no conocí, pero que seguramente inspiró a mis ancestros y ancestras a parir la libertad y a seguir luchando por la dignidad de los pueblos en el mundo. Eh, para mí un placer estar con la doctora Bárbara Rambi y con Yamela Hussein. Yo creo que compartimos historias, aunque no nos conocíamos, pero pues la política de la muerte nos golpea en todos los lugares del mundo y a veces de las mismas formas. Yo quiero antes de de hablar cómo hemos visto la solidaridad internacional y cómo esa solidaridad se, se cruza entre los movimientos de resistencia. Quiero expresar primero que vengo de un territorio ancestral y cuando digo ancestral es porque hemos estado ahí desde 1636, desde que los ancestros y ancestras de nosotros traídos de la madre África fueron... Eh, condenados a la esclavitud y sometidos a ese sistema esclavista, desde entonces hemos estado ahí. Por nuestras mentes y nuestras memorias siempre ha cruzado el lenguaje de nuestros mayores y mayoras que jamás se dejaron someter, que siempre tuvieron firme la libertad en su mente, la libertad por la dignidad y la lucha por parir la vida. ¿Sí? Hombres y mujeres, muchos que nunca aprendieron a leer ni a escribir, pero que nos enseñaron valores que se ponían y se tejían sobre el valor de la vida. Y yo creo que son los valores que desde muy niña, desde muy pequeño, nos han enseñado a hacernos parte de la comunidad y a sentirnos parte de esa lucha histórica que, como ya han mencionado, las personas, las compañeras que me antecedieron, se cruza y se teje en el mundo. Ese territorio la toma, eh, comprendido por cinco veredas, aún tiene las huellas de la esclavitud, aún encontramos las piedras colocadas de los lugares donde trabajaron en condición de esclavitud nuestros mayores, pero también están las huellas de la resistencia y de la dignidad que no se compra y que no se vende. Creo que hemos crecido entonces ahí siempre escuchando la memoria de nuestros mayores de cuidar, por supuesto, el territorio como un espacio de vida. En el norte del Cauca, un territorio que aún conserva Apellidos de ascendencia africana como el Lukumi, como el Balanta, como el Mina, como el Congo, como el Popó, como el Mozorongó, como el Mandinga, ¿sí? nos dicen que la resistencia y, y la posibilidad de lograr la libertad plena de los pueblos está también en la, en la autonomía y la autodeterminación de los pueblos de autogobernarse. ¿sí? y autodeterminarse, pero también en la posibilidad de cuidar nuestros territorios como espacio de vida. Nuestra lucha sin duda está enraizada en el cuidado y en la defensa de los territorios. Y en esta lucha, como dijo Rose, tuve la oportunidad de viajar a los Estados Unidos, por supuesto eh, tejiendo con pueblos del sur, de los Estados Unidos que también han hecho esa apuesta por la autonomía y por la autodeterminación y por la libertad de los pueblos. Encontramos voces de expanteras negras diciendo que su momento, la lucha que hicieron allá en los Estados Unidos, en su momento por la tierra, por el territorio como un espacio de vida, por el territorio como un espacio de libertad, se había podido lograr acá en Colombia con la Constitución del 91 y posteriormente con la Ley 70 del 93, ley que por supuesto el racismo estructural que hoy permea eh, las condiciones de expropiación de nuestra dignidad, tal como lo plantea eh, 
la abogada Bernabé Atuagené siguen, pese a esas situaciones, yo creo que haber logrado la titulación colectiva de los territorios ancestrales habitados históricamente por los pueblos afrodescendientes y la, y la relación intrínseca con los pueblos indígenas nos ha permitido resistir a esa política, a ese proyecto de muerte. Por supuesto no es fácil y hay situaciones que nos conectan y es que tanto el pueblo palestino como los pueblos afrodescendientes yo creo que hemos vivido la misma historia de expropiación de nuestra condición humana. Por tanto, la resistencia y la articulación de acciones para frenar esa política de muerte que se sigue imponiendo es una necesidad. La misma situación con los Estados Unidos. Y a partir de ahí quiero contar como varias experiencias que he tenido la primera vez nos estaban despojando en 2009, en lo que tengo de, de años, por supuesto, la lucha de las mujeres y hombres negros no empezó con nosotros, ha sido una lucha que ha sido permanente y nosotros somos la continuidad de ese proceso. Pero en 2009, cuando privilegiaron los derechos de un tercero, de una empresa multinacional, este gobierno, este estado racial y negó el derecho a los pueblos de permanecer y al pueblo de la toma de permanecer en su territorio. Lo primero que se nos ocurrió fue acudir a la comunidad internacional. Lo primero que se nos ocurrió fue viajar a los Estados Unidos y buscar a gente muy poderosa como Angela Davis, gente que siempre alzó la voz en contra de las injusticias para que su voz, sí, fuera una voz de resonancia que nos pudiera ayudar a parar el exterminio que en su momento significaba el despojo del territorio ancestral de la toma. Por supuesto, encontrar a esta mujer en lo personal fue maravilloso para mí, fue una experiencia única escucharle decir, claro que tengo que solidarizarme con ustedes porque precisamente la solidaridad internacional sal salvó mi vida en un momento donde estaba condenada a pena de muerte. Oh. Es una demostración que cuando los pueblos se unen, cuando las voces se articulan, podemos hacer los cambios que necesitemos. Solo nos falta reconocer que al lado hay un hermano, que al lado hay un pueblo que lucha y que resiste al igual que nosotros. Por supuesto, eso implica revisarnos en nuestra accionar y un poco de lo que decían ahora, la revolución no solamente es hacia afuera, sino hacia adentro. ¿Sí? Y por ejemplo, parte de lo que tendría que revisar el pueblo estadounidense es que, y reconocer que su política de muerte que hoy oprimen a América Latina, que hoy oprimen al pueblo palestino, que hoy oprimen al continente africano y muchas otras regiones del mundo, precisamente se basan en garantizar condiciones de privilegio para algunos en los Estados Unidos, para una supremacía blanca que aún permanece intacta, que aún se mantiene intacta a costa de la destrucción masiva de seres humanos y de pueblos y de territorios en el mundo. Por tanto, yo creo que el gran desafío es seguir alzando la voz, seguir diciendo que las vidas negras importan, que las vidas de los pueblos palestinos importan, que las vidas de los pueblos indígenas importan, que las vidas de las poblaciones diversas importan, que las vidas de toda la humanidad importan. Creo que es el desafío que, que, que tenemos y por supuesto algo que, que para nosotros fue mucha coincidencia es que en 2014 cuando se levantaron las mujeres negras en los Estados Unidos a decir que las vidas negras importan, las mujeres negras del norte, del Cauca, al mismo tiempo estaban alzando la voz demandando parar la minería ilegal, demandando parar la minería a gran escala 
que estaba destruyendo las posibilidades de vida en sus territorios, que estaba envenenando sus cuerpos. Al mismo tiempo, las mujeres negras en esta región estaban alzando la voz frente a los actores armados que nos matan todos los días y nos asesinan, que nos destierran, que nos desplazan forzosamente todos los días y nos condenan a vivir un sufrimiento excesivo de lo que ha sido la violencia, la represión y, por supuesto, desde este estado criminal que, que tenemos en, en nuestro país. Pero también yo creo que hay conexiones de esa violencia que nos atraviesan. Y es que muchos de estos pueblos, acá en Colombia y en América Latina, padecemos los mismos sufrimientos que el pueblo negro o afrodescendiente en los Estados Unidos. La política antidrogas de nuestro país, diseñada por los Estados Unidos, ha sido una política que ha servido para dejar muerte en los territorios y poner la riqueza en los bancos. Pero esa misma política antidroga ha servido para encarcelar a la gente y motilarle el pensamiento de libertad que han puesto los ancestros, que han puesto los mayores y mayoras en nosotros y nosotras. Entonces el pueblo negro en los Estados Unidos vive las consecuencias de la política antidroga y nosotros acá también vivimos el exterminio y el genocidio de esa política. Una política que es transnacional y que nos atraviesa y que nos golpea a los mismos pueblos en distintos lugares. De la misma forma que la política minera, sí, de la misma forma que la política armamentista que nos golpea y nos mata, acá es la misma política armamentista que, que tira bombas y que asesina a la gente en, en, en Palestina. Creo que ahí tenemos una historia en común, tristemente es esa historia de dolor y de barbarie, pero que... No es, ese no es mi problema, ese es el problema que nos ocurre a muchos en distintos territorios. Entonces, así como la política de muerte se ha globalizado, creo que nosotros tenemos el desafío y la responsabilidad de globalizar la resistencia en favor de la vida. Y eso es conocer, conocernos qué está pasando en cada lugar para tejer desde ahí estrategias que nos impliquen de construir esa visión de mundo sin nosotros, esa visión de mundo que nos extermina, que nos expropia, que nos daña, que nos lastima y que pisotea todos los días nuestra humanidad. Y por supuesto esa visión de mundo que hoy tiene al útero mayor, al planeta, la casa grande, extinguiéndose la vida en ella todos los días. Creo que hoy hay algo en común y es que la mayoría de los pueblos que resistimos entendemos que somos parte de la naturaleza, que no somos dueños de ella y que la naturaleza, siendo la madre mayor de, todas, de todos nosotros, creo que nos pone hoy en una, en una reflexión profunda a partir de la pandemia que hoy nos mata por supuesto, la crisis no es la pandemia en sí, la pandemia que hoy, del COVID que hoy afecta la vida es una consecuencia de esa política de muerte, es una consecuencia de la degradación frente a la vida humana. Creo que entonces avanzar en en articulación de acciones, en tejer entre los pueblos será parte de las estrategias que podamos seguir eh, avanzando y sobre todo tomando la decisión de ser poder, de recuperar estos estados para ponerlos al servicio de la vida, para ponerlos al servicio de la paz, para ponerlos al servicio de la dignidad humana. Estoy de acuerdo con lo que dicen, que cuando toda la gente negra sea, sea libre, por supuesto la humanidad será libre en tanto esos conceptos de libertad, de dignidad, de ciudadanía, quienes han venido empujándolos de alguna manera han sido estos pueblos históricamente violentados, históricamente racializados, históricamente excluidos. 
hoy ha sido doloroso para mí porque a pesar de estar aquí hablando con ustedes en la mañana estaba en una reunión con la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos porque creo que la esclavitud no ha pasado y ahora mismo el conflicto armado está sometiendo a nuestro pueblo a vivir una esclavitud moderna. Nos están obligando a sembrar cultivos de uso ilícito, están obligando a hacer minería con mercurio en nuestros territorios que nos dañan, en un estado que no nos permite tener agua potable, que no nos permite tener acceso a salud, que no nos permite tener acceso a educación. Eh, nos están sometiendo a la barbarie y es doloroso cuando un sistema como el Sistema Interamericano de Derechos Humanos que uno creería está para garantizar la vida, pues te pone a demostrar, ¿sí? Que tienes que mostrar detalladamente los hechos y las violencias a las, que, a las que históricamente hemos sido sometidos. Y es doloroso eso, es triste eso, porque hasta cuándo nosotros tenemos que demostrar ¿sí? que esa política de muerte nos ha hecho sufrir, nos ha dañado y nos sigue destruyendo física y culturalmente. Creo que es parte también de cómo pensarse un sistema de derechos humanos que se piense más en el colectivo y no simplemente visione todo desde lo individual. Creo que es necesario seguir pariendo una política para la vida como mujeres, como pueblos, como comunidades y desde ahí pues vamos avanzando. Yo agradezco mucho este espacio de diálogo, intercambio con todas ustedes. Eh, confieso que no conocía a la persona a quien hoy se le honra su memoria, pero siempre pues, elevar la memoria de las personas que han contribuido a hacer de, de este mundo un mejor lugar para vivir siempre será una honra para quienes vamos aprendiendo y vamos siguiendo esos pasos de resistencia, de dignidad, de rebeldía por la vida y de amor, por, por la libertad, de amor, por, por el cuidado, de amor, por seguir permitiendo que este planeta siga siendo nuestra casa, que siga siendo nuestro útero mayor y que siga acobijándonos, abrigándonos con todo lo que nos ofrece todos los días. Muchas gracias y bueno, como dicen los pueblos originarios africanos, Ubuntu, nosotros decimos soy porque somos y los pueblos no nos rendimos carajo, así que seguimos en resistencia. Thank you so much, Francia, and to all of you. I just want to take one minute to say that in the 22 years of this lecture, this is the first time we've been able to invite um, someone from Latin America. So we, we welcome you and we hope that we will be able to expand our commitment to language justice in the future and thereby hear more voices from the South. So thank you again. Now, Amy, Jordan, and I are going to um, read the questions in turn. We have about 15 minutes and we would like any one of the three panelists to respond to any one of them. So Amy, do you wanna read the first one? Yeah, I'd also like to thank our panelists and also thank you for being in conversation with each other in, in such a clear and visible way um, already. Okay, so our first question is from Fiana. What do you see as the role of artists in our practices in collective liberation work? What is that for, Amy? Actually, it's not specific. Oh, oh it's for anybody who we'd like you any okay. and all. I'll, I'll just I'll start briefly. You know, we um, so I'm one of my latest projects is a, a collective project, just the only kind that's worthwhile. Uh, is um, called the Portal Project, and it's talking about pandemic as portal, uh, uh, borrowing from you know Arundhati Roy and, and others. 
And uh, we have, we're organizing a series of conversations and working groups uh, with artists, activists, and scholars. And the artist piece is really important. It's important because, um, you know, as I listen, I just have to say, you know, as I listen to uh, Jamila and um, Francia, uh, just the, the power of those words. I mean, uh, you know, resistance movements um, have forced empire to show its face and that we have to embrace values um, at the center of our movement, so, so true. And uh, uh, Francia, you know, saying, you know, the politics of death demand that we globalize a resistance for life. I mean, that's, th those are eloquent, the poetic remarks right there. But they, they speak to a visceral level at which we have to touch people and, and get in touch with ourselves in order to commit for the kind of radical change, the kind of revolutionary change that, uh, that we're talking about. And I think artists help us get there. Um, visual artists, uh, movement artists, um, lyricists, poets, um, you know, help us close our eyes and imagine what we don't see in front of us, uh, help us find the strength that connects us to generations of freedom fighters. Um, and so I, I think we can't um, overstate the importance of art, not as a footnote to what we do, but as central to what we do. Thank you, Barbara. Does anyone else want to speak to that question? Yamila. I mean, the, the, my first reaction when I heard the question is, how else? We, we cannot do it without artists. Um, I, I, like, I don't know how. I, I was just looking at a, a quote that I didn't read, but um, at one point, um, Dr. Iqbal is talking about how those of us engaged in the struggle and resistance um, need to always keep in mind, uh, appreciate and honor the human sanctity. These are, this is my paraphrasing. But he talks about appreciating and honoring human sanctity and human need for love, connection, celebration, joy, remembering, creating, and reinventing. And I cannot see how this, any of this can happen without the artist. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, Francia, do you want to speak to that? Francia. <coughs> bueno, yo creo que nosotros hemos estado en los últimos años empujando una lucha por que la paz y la paz como el silenciamiento de los fusiles en nuestro país sea una realidad porque esto ha dañado a tanta gente, ha destruido tantas vidas, tantos territorios que no aguantamos más. Y quienes hemos padecido las consecuencias del conflicto armado, de la guerra, hemos deseado a gritos vivir en paz. Las mujeres negras, las mujeres indígenas, las mujeres campesinas, son las que han parido sus hijos y sus hijos han sido puestos al servicio de la muerte. Entonces, cuando sentimos que nos quebrantamos, cuando sentimos que ya no podemos más, llega el arte, llega la música, llegan los instrumentos, el bombo, el cununo, la marimba, como ese instrumento sanador, pero también como ese instrumento de, que nos permite respirar, que nos permite soñar, como ya decían, y que nos permita... Eh, llenarnos de esperanzas para seguir luchando por un mundo mejor, por un mundo más justo, por un mundo en libertad. Entonces, sin dudas, el arte sana, el arte cura, el arte inspira, el arte nos da esperanzas para caminar y en nuestro propio país la gente negra pudo aguantar la... Eh, trata transatlántica y después pudimos aguantar la barbarie de la esclavitud gracias a que estaba la memoria sonora de, de, del arte, de la cultura ancestral, de la, del bombo, eh, del el cununo, el tambor, todos estos instrumentos que han sido símbolos de libertad para nosotros y sin duda no hubiéramos podido soportar esta barbarie de lo que ha sido el conflicto armado en nuestro país si el arte, la música, el deporte no hubiera estado ahí. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to do these quickly because we we have such we have such a little bit of time. Um, so the next question is, is multiple and it refers to the US context immediately. I'd like to hear the panelists views on the turn to interest in change through electoral politics. There's been an urgency to fight the forces of authoritarianism and fascism, but how should we be thinking about this in the long term? When is it appropriate to take street fighting into in institutions? And when do we think we risk compromising too much? And Barbara immediately smiled, but I know Francia has also decided to run for president of her country. So I imagine she too will have something to say. So I don't know, Barbara, did you want to? Well, yes, I mean, this is a big um, issue debate um, within movement spaces uh, right now. I think it was right that people rallied to um, defeat Donald Trump. I mean, it was a strategic moment. It was a critical uh, moment. I also think, and, and we had, you know, within the Movement for Black Lives, the Electoral Justice Project led by Jessica Byrd and Kayla Reed and others, and the new emergence of the Working Families Party, the um, uh, Justice Democrats and, and, and a number of other sort of very progressive uh, forces that are doing electoral justice work is hopeful that the, the so-called squad, you know, Ilhan uh, Omar, um, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Rashida Tlaib and um, Ayanna Presley, plus, and plus the new people, Cori Bush and others, all of that uh, bodes well for that particular arena of struggle. That said, that is only one arena of struggle. And, you know, to our detriment that we reduce activism to voting, right? Voting is one part. And people who go from movement into electoral work, particularly into the Democratic Party, have to function as outsiders within. That is, have to uh, view the larger movement ecosystem as the home base. Uh, and the larger set of tactics, strategies, and goals of a movement um, as the larger container or the big tent rather than the electoral uh, movement being in service to the electoral. I mean, I can say a lot more about this. I think about it a lot, and, uh, but that's, that's a, short, a short answer as I could give to that question, but it's a really important one. Francia, did you want to speak to that? Bueno, yo creo que lo que está pasando hoy con el movimiento de los Estados Unidos es importante en darle valor al voto. Creo que América Latina también seguimos y bueno, aquí también se están dando procesos propios de tomarse el poder, ¿sí? de tomar y llenar de contenido la democracia, porque toda la vida nos han hablado de democracia, pero es de una supremacía racial que no reivindica y que no llena y que no significa nada para muchos pueblos marginados y excluidos. Y por muchos tiempos también los movimientos sociales dijeron que no hay que meterse en la política representativa. Sin embargo, hoy hemos tomado esa decisión porque si bien la política representativa no es un fin si sí es un medio para seguir avanzando y seguir empujando las luchas que por supuesto hacemos desde cada uno de los lugares que tenemos. Hoy Estados Unidos tiene la primera mujer afrodescendiente. Yo acabé de, yo le envié una carta como presidenta del Consejo Nacional de Paz, Reconciliación y Convivencia aquí en Colombia. Y primero que le decía era que ella no llegó sola ya, ella llegó porque otras mujeres negras hicieron el camino, mujeres como Angela Davis, mujeres como Achata Chacur, mujeres como Rosa Parr hicieron el camino para que ella hoy esté ahí acompañando a, al presidente Biden en la Casa Blanca. Por supuesto, Obama tampoco hubiera logrado ser presidente si este movimiento de las Panteras Negras no hubiera hecho lo que hizo, así hoy todavía hayan miembros de las Panteras Negras pudriéndose en las cárceles. Yo creo que lo que esperamos de esta gente es que reconozcan que esos lugares que se han avanzado, esos lugares que han logrado posicionar, si obedecen a gente que incluso le costó la vida y que sacrificaron su propia vida para hacer ese camino de una justicia, de un país digno, de un país que genera esperanza no solamente para los estadounidenses, sino para el mundo. 
y yo la mayor esperanza por la cual me sentía que cuando la gente en Estados Unidos estaba luchando porque Biden ganara, yo también sentía que era como mi propia candidatura que estaba empujando desde acá, desde Colombia, porque tenía la, y sigo teniendo la esperanza de que en términos de, de política, eh, de justicia ambiental y ecológica, va a ser un cambio que significará mucho para el mundo. Y eso significará para estos territorios en concreto eh, menos presiones por la política extractivista que hoy, nos, que hoy nos daña y nos lastima. Muchísimo. Muchísimas gracias. No sé, Jamila, do you want to say anything or should we move on? Okay. So we have a third question. Um, I just lost one, please. In, all right. Um, we have uh, Roni Benchir wondering about the Palestinian resistance as a movement. As an Israeli, um, he would like to, encur to encourage dialogue. What are your thoughts about dialogue with Israel? That sounds like a question for Dr. Hussein Shannon and everyone. Um, I just want to read it to make sure. Um, oh, Ronit. Um, Ronit, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we're supposed to have been having dialogue with the Israelis since, since 1991. And look at where we are. So I, I, what do I think of dialogue? Dialogue brought bombing and more killings and a new layer of oppression through something called Palestinian Authority and the total invasion of the banks and the corporations. Um, do you want a dialogue about what? I mean, I, I, I yeah, like, yeah we, we, we did that, we tried that. Dialogue with whom, about what? Okay. Thank you, Jamila. I think we have time for maybe one more question, or do we? Um, this is a question about Syria and why has Syria um, and the US dirty war in Syria not been on the agenda of radical movements? Well, it should be. I mean, it has been on the agenda of, you know, of some folks. It's just not, um, you know, it's not talked about enough. I, I think, you know, the Trump era, people were so obsessed with uh, this spectacle and, and also the real threat of um, a kind of proto-fascist uh, regime here that people failed to look at the international as much as, 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 really the international demand it because um, you know we, we, we see not only replicas of Trump around the world but the militarist you know what's happening in Syria is um, uh, is, is, is terrible what's happening in Yemen um, is is terrible it requires us to speak out um, and I think the um, Center for economic uh, uh, CEDP it's uh, Mark Weisbrot's Institute in DC, the Center for Economic Policy Research um, has, has um, you know, has done some work on this in the Institute for Policy Studies. But in terms of a mass issue, we really, I'm, I'm hopeful for groups like, there's a new group led by youth of color here called the Dissenters. And, you know, they've been drawing attention to all kinds of US military policies all over the world as an extension of their anti-racist and anti-colonial work. Thank you. I think you answered. I, I actually misrepresented the question. He, he was um, asking or they were asking um, about the muzzling of dissent against the war in Syria. And I think you you referenced the, the pre the preoccupation with internal things um, and making it hard to look out. But I don't know. Yamila, did you want to speak to that at all or no? Um, no, no. I mean, I, I think part, the only thing I want to say is that when, when you look at the fact that the United States has military bases in how many countries around the world, how many territories, uh, in which countries are U.S. spy agencies infiltrated. Um, so 
there, there is a part that says, yes, it needs to be international. We need to be paying attention to all uh, the world. And at the same time, there is also the question of uh, paying attention locally. So, so I, I mean, I just wanted, wanted to put it out there that th there is the need to do the connections and there's also the need, um, oftentimes when I speak and um, young white people, uh, when I, they ask me, what can I do? And I say, fix your house. Mm -hmm. Just take, take care of the US. You still think yeah. it's a democracy? Do something about it. Because if the US starts improving from within, the rest of the world is going to start breathing in one way or another. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. You know, I, um, uh, Angela Davis has been mentioned a number of times and, um, you know, she's, you know, such a uh, connective tissue to all of our movements. And I was privileged to uh, go with her and 11 other women of color on the delegation to Palestine in um, 2011. And this was the most common um, chorus that we heard, you know, do, do, do work at home. And we were, we were women of color. So it was, it was a different uh, scenario, but um, you know, the work, the, the enabling work that the U S does in so many places in the world, if we fought the, the good fight um, to move things in a progressive direction here, it would indeed have ripple effect. It would indeed be solidarity, uh, you know, of, of the highest order because of the damage that's done through U S foreign policy. Well, I, I think that this conversation is really just beginning and there are so many requests in the chat for the transcript and um, I think you can just contact me. I've put my email in there and we will make that available. People have been saying that they feel it will be very fruitful for their organizing. So for that, we feel um, additionally grateful to you all. And I, it's very hard to bring this to an end, but I, I think we have to after two, two very stimulating and moving hours. Um, and so, yes, thank you again. And I don't know if my fellow committee, if anyone else wants to say anything as we go out. I, I also want to say thank you. And I think it's um, appropriate that we would end on a kind of articulation of the relationship between the local and the global, which I think we often don't hold. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you so much for Rayanne for holding us together technically with the, um, this technology and the interpreters with the ASL and the Spanish language interpreters it was so much work. And I just wanna acknowledge how important that was um, for this event. And I hope that these conversations we could find a way to continue. Yeah. Thank you to the organizers. <laughs> Thank you to the organizers and the panelists. Panelist. Francia, fue un honor escucharte y aprender de Colombia y saber un poco más. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Talante, talante, talante. Great. Muchas gracias a ustedes y un abrazo ancestral y seguimos para adelante con el puño arriba. Marquez for Prez. Marquez for Prez. Mm -hmm. um, we hope that you will keep us informed about your campaign for president. Yeah. We now have um, another following. <laughs> okay, thank you all. I'm going to end it. Esto es un desafío porque aquí no están acostumbrados siquiera que una mujer negra diga que quiere ser presidente de ese país. Eso no le pasa por la cabeza a nadie. Y el simple hecho de atrevernos es irrumpir con la historia de, de barbarie y de que ha manejado la élite aquí. Así que esto es también parte de la reparación histórica que nos debemos para con nuestro pueblo y vamos a hacer todos los esfuerzos necesarios por avanzar. No será fácil, aquí han asesinado a candidatos presidenciales que han querido hacer cambios en la historia de este país, pero los ancestros y las ancestras nos guiarán y nos acompañarán en este camino. Creo que estamos siguiendo el legado de las 
ancestras y ancestras por seguir pariendo la libertad y la dignidad. I've been asked to say it, I've put it in the chat, but we don't know yet where the recording will be stored, but you can, you can contact me by email and I put my email, mcerullo at Hampshire. So thank, thank you all again. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Like us, really to Gracias, Rose. <laughs> How wonderful. It's so, I'm so moved. I think everybody is full of, of so, so much, um, so many kind of moving moments and inspiration. I think you, you have a campaign committee here. <laughs> right. Good night, everyone. Um, we're still on. We're still. Oh. Marla, we're still brought so, I want to just say a special thank you to all three panelists. That was just amazing to hear you. Um, so much to think on. It was just so rich. And the fact that we were all together in this space is just really moving and beautiful. And I, I, I'm just very grateful.